What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Welcome everyone. Today's guest manages the design and construction process for external hotel owners, delivering transformational asset renovations for a wide range of clients from REITs to private equity companies to you name it. He is a senior manager of hospitality project management at CBRE. Ladies and gentlemen, Ethan Gabani. Thanks Welcome, for having Ethan. me, Dan. Great to be here. It's so good to have you here. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about to have you here in person is we only met a little while ago. A couple of weeks ago over dinner. Yeah. Well, actually, before we met at a host... Um, strategic supplier st event. Yes, yes. Strategic a, supplier a great event. event. Um, but then we were having dinner and I was like, you look really familiar. Where did I know you? And we put it all together. It's such a small and sometimes incestuous industry, isn't it? Right? You see a face and you're like, I know that person, but I don't know how or where. And then people that you mutually know put you in touch and suggest you connect. And I think that's what makes our industry so so different and unique. Yeah. And I think it's also just um, for many of the people who are on here, like we're all just really curious. We want to learn more. We want to do the best we can. And we always want to be growing. But um, I was just very struck um, by you as far as, you know, just being out there, putting yourself out there. Your network seems to be amazing. Um, you're very young, but you have a lot of experience. And I really loved your story of how you chose hospitality. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess as we begin, before we get into that, I just ask everyone who's here, how do you define hospitality? I, I think for me, I would define hospitality is anticipating a guest needs, whether it's a guest or a client or, or someone that you're working with, whoever it is in life, you know, looking at what their needs are before they have even realized them themselves and delivering a product or service to address those needs um, with compassion and with empathy. Fantastic. I mean, I have so many questions about that idea yeah. of anticipation and empathy. Yeah. How do you balance um, that idea of anticipation and empathy and making sure everything is delivered well? Yeah. Right? To also having to create accountability on multi-million dollar projects, yeah. right? Just, yeah. Not just it's for you, but for all of your construction guys and gals and yeah. vendors, but also trying to keep your your clients happy as well. And as you know, in doing a lot of these renovations or new builds, time is money. Yes. Right? Yes. But you want to make sure everyone is heard and everyone feels good. Yeah. But you also got to deliver. So I think in the, in the way we approach projects and delivering projects, right? I think the empathy part and the understanding part typically comes up front, right? Mm -hmm. When we get together, we have our first walkthrough of a property. We might have a property improvement plan we're looking at or just walking with the owner and trying to understand what their goals are for an mm -hmm. asset or what they want to achieve in a renovation. You know, that's the moment where we want all the ideas to come to the table, right? We want operations to weigh in with what their concerns are. We want mm -hmm. the ownership group to weigh in. We want the designers and the brand to bring unique and different ideas to the table, right? But at some point, that becomes a lot of data, right? And often conflicting interests and things that are, are not necessarily in alignment. And so our job as a project manager is to sort of cut through the noise and think about the ownership's interest in the asset, what their goals are as far as the investment that they're about to make in a really transformative, you know, transformational renovation, and cutting through the noise and distilling it to the essence of what's nice to have, what's a must have, and how we sort of establish that early on so we can build a budget and a schedule that achieves those objectives, but lets everybody's opinions and voices be heard. It's, it's an art, not a science, right? Like there's always some push and pull in it and negotiations and things that change even as design developed. You know, I can't tell you how many times in a first meeting we're like, no, we're not gonna do that. And then three months, four months later, we're sitting there at the design table like, remember that idea we shelved four months ago? Like maybe we should talk about that again, right? Yeah. It, it's always an evolution. 
So I love the idea of it. It's not an art or a science. It's kind of yeah. something in between, right? Yeah. So we, on a typical project that you get, your, your client hires you. Yes. Are you then hiring out all of your other consultants from design to architect to we are in a typical project there are exceptions you know we have some clients that we perform just construction management services mm -hmm. for where we drop a body on the construction site during the course of construction and make sure something gets built but in the overwhelming majority of our projects we are the first point of contact when a project's getting started we you know some clients sit down and say hey i know these are the four or five design firms i want to engage and perhaps hire there are some clients that look to us and say, who do you like? Who are you having good experiences with working in the architecture world, design world, procurement world, you know? And it's sort of that fun collaborative process for us that helps us build the right project team. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, you know, we talked earlier a bit about how small the industry is and how much relationships matter. You know, we have a project right now that's an architect and a designer from different parts of the world that I put together on a project back in 2019. The owner actually hired us after they hired those same consultants that we had paired together, it was almost like getting the band back together. Oh, wow. Um, in a way that we hadn't expected. And so, you know, I think there's, there's, a there's a really great circuit and a broad circuit of designers and architects and everyone in this industry, but it's amazing how small the world is when people start getting back together um, and synchronizing on projects again. Mm. Yeah, oh, 2019 back then. But, you know, we're here at Alice right now and all the seminars I've been going to, it's, we're now, surpassing 2019 numbers, which was a banner year. It's a great thing for us. You know, at CBRE, we have really great, you know, research reporting and data that we supply to the industry. And, and our research team this year is saying, we're not comparing against 2019 for the first time. We're comparing against 2022 because we finally have a good solid year yeah. of post COVID. I use the air quotes here. Um, performance data that we can benchmark against. And if you look at last year's performance, we're talking roughly 30% improvement in RevPAR uh, over the past 12 months, which has been remarkable. So uh, I forget the gentleman's name from ISHC. He was doing a, it was about the 4% capital reserves that a hotel typically as a rule of thumb needs to put into capital reserves. Yes. Um, it was interesting because they plotted this graph as a percentage of revenue Okay. And in 2020, 2021, the percentage was off the charts because there was no, there was very little or no revenue. Yes. But they were still spending money because that money's been baked in. But as they went to look forward and they're like plotting, continuing to plot the line, they did something really interesting. They're like, you know what? Let's just erase 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021 so that we can plot a smoother line. And it, And plotting that line, it actually looks... Like everything is back on Stable. track. Stable. Yeah. yeah. But the reason why I bring that up, especially for the hats that you wear, um, a few minutes ago you said something about things that we would like to have versus need to have. And that's where the art and science comes yes. in. Yes. And I'm always super intrigued. And I know, I think we spoke about this um, a while ago. I'm always very intrigued by how you measure ROI on design. Because it's, it's, it's such it's a very, good question. It's hard to do. But again, when you're looking at the nice to have, need to have, like what's your what's your process or what's your you know rule of oh, thumb God. or how if how I you, if I had it? an answer to that one, I, I don't, it's crazy. You know, you're right. It's really hard to qualify. There's a good ROI on design. I, I firmly believe that at my core. Right. When a property looks better, it performs better. And if you look at, you know, we're the conference has gravitated and where people go for dinners outside of the conference, like they're not picking to eat in a very commercialized setting. They're picking the cooler design oriented trendy places. And that's where people are gravitating. If they're not staying on site at one of the host hotels, that's where they're gravitating to stay in the local market. So I do think there's an appeal for good design. You're right. It's hard to quantify that. Mm -hmm. Right. And to put that into metrics. We always look at it as what's the investment thesis for the hotel, right? And there are some hotels that we work on where if we really elevate the design and the offering, we can drive an additional 30, 40, $50 a night of rate and we're gonna push it to the next level, mm -hmm. you know? Well, then it becomes easier to quantify whether that design's having an impact and achieving its, its desired outcome. For us, you know, there's also on the opposite end of that spectrum, Hotels where you can pour all the money into the world, but you're not going to drive rate and you're not going to drive occupancy. And so 
those are the assets that are maybe a little bit um, a little bit less customized and a little less personalized as far as the design approach goes and more one size fits all do the renovation that you have to do reposition the asset as you need to but realize you're not going to get any major lift out of it mm. so and then do you do you ever do like after action what what's the once because oftentimes you know you're done with the project you move on yeah right you're on to the next one but do you ever look at once you're done with the project kind of look back on performance of some of those decisions so it's funny because we're third party you know we don't hear that story too much unless mm. it's either really bad or really good <laughs> right and the owners call us back and they're like Hey, remember that investment we did there? You know, I worked on a project with an old firm that we poured a lot of money into renovating the asset, and a few months later, it got sold and became a homeless shelter. Right? That was a Oof. poor ROI investment. I also think about projects where you know we knew the investment thesis going in, we knew what we had to spend on a renovation, and then we hear anecdotally from our brokerage side or another part of the business, hey, that hotel just transacted for X, Y, or Z, and we're like, wait, what? Like the goal was it was gonna sell for 700 a key post renovation, it sold for a million a key. We're like, that's where we pat ourselves on the back and say, wow. good job. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So with your, to quote Liam Neeson, with your um, particular set of skills, <laughs> right? You could manage projects in, within any real estate class. Yeah. Right? So why hotels? That's a great question. I was always drawn to the industry since I was young, right? Mm -hmm. So. It's kind of hard to answer that question without giving a little bit of background, and I won't speak too much to it. But I grew no, up. No, speak to it. I grew up in rural Western Pennsylvania. My, oh, Johnstown. Johnstown, where Pennsylvania. Where my mother-in-law is. Yep. Right. yep. Famous flood uh, in 1889, and and I grew up on a street that was sort of summer vacation homes for the barons of the 18th century. Andrew Carnegie. And these gorgeous old mansions that became dilapidated, and at the center of it was the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, which is this abandoned clubhouse that's still one day in the back of my mind, I'd love to reinvent in some meaningful way. It's the pipe dream down the road. But I sort of, I grew up, my, my dad owned a gas station. It was a full service gas station in a small town. And so when I was probably 11 or 12 years old, I started pumping gas. And just that innate human interaction and connection with people and learning their stories and who your regular, regular customers are and and building relationships with people is something that I always gravitated toward. And so I always loved being like the family vacation planner. So when we would take that once a year summer vacation, I always wanted to pick out where we were going, where we were staying, what we were seeing. And the where we were staying thing became increasingly interesting to me because vacations are an escape from reality of your day-to-day -day life, right? And so uh, I remember being 12 and I was a huge history buff at the time and wanted to go to Philadelphia just to see Independence Hall and the Constitution mm. Center and you know, all the great history of that city. And we stayed at the Ritz-Carlton in Philadelphia, which is an old converted bank building, really yeah, beautiful, beautiful asset, right? And I wanted to be a chef at the time. And I remember having breakfast in the restaurant and the cook, you know, I wouldn't even say chef, like the breakfast cook came by the table and asked how everything was. But he was wearing a white chef's jacket and a white hat. and. I was just mesmerized as a young kid and seeing somebody that I aspired to be one day. And my mom sort of poked and prodded me to express my interest in culinary arts and wanting to be a chef to him. And long story short, he invited me back into the kitchen and it was an open kitchen, but he was like, come back in the kitchen and start today and you can be a chef with me. And I don't think I did any real cooking. I like threw the chocolate chips on the pancakes or something. But as a 12 year old, like it was such a transformative experience, right? And when we checked out of the hotel, the whole staff of the restaurant signed the Ritz-Carlton cookbook and they all left nice little encouraging messages for me. And I took that home and I, I remember having it under my bed for years to come. It was just like a constant source of inspiration and something that, that I remembered and had a great memory to. And to me, you know, we talk about defining hospitality, like that's hospitality, right? And I feel the jaded part of me feels that interactions like that are increasingly rare in this day and age, right? But when you can let somebody have that feeling, you know, that was a moment that I knew I wanted to do hotels. Yeah, and you'll never forget it. And I'll never forget it. That's like your origin story. It is. Yeah, yeah. truly. And then, okay, so that's from when you're 12, 13. Yeah, yeah. So then, you know, you make your way through high school and then what were your next steps? Yeah, so I, I was 
going to college and I was very split about two things, whether I wanted to do hospitality, right, from that experience and loving hotels or entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, I started a business when I was in high school selling frette bed linens oh, online. Cool. And I remember not knowing which I wanted to do. So when I was applying to colleges, I applied to Cornell for its hotel program, and I applied to Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, small little entrepreneurial business school, um, because I was very fascinated by their entrepreneurship program. And Cornell deferred me and then waitlisted me, and Babson accepted me. And being someone who just doesn't deal well with rejection, I said, (laughs) screw Cornell, I'm gonna go to Babson. And, And I went there for a year, and then ultimately felt like the hospitality part that I loved was missing from the education I was getting there and that propelled me to transfer to Cornell as a sophomore and continue my studies there specifically in the hotel space. Wow. Okay, so as a sophomore you moved to Ithaca. I moved to Ithaca. Yep. And bringing your entrepreneurial baggage. Yes. And then uh, what kind of course load did they serve you up with and I'm sure you have so many choices from hotel yeah, operations to totally. finance. Like, how did you choose your way through Cornell? How did you so navigate I, that? So I worked in operations since I was in high school. My first job was in the housekeeping department of an Omni resort in rural western Pennsylvania, where I grew up. I interned at a what's now a Rosewood property in Washington, D.C., where I live today. And I always was fascinated by the operations piece. Mm. Um, what I learned, you know, after working a few summers in operations is that it's a 24 seven job, 365 days a year. It's really hard to have great work-life balance. You're always moving. If you're at a luxury hotel company, especially that's the way that you advance. And for me, the one common thread through all the hotels that I worked in was that it felt as an operator, like they were designed and built by people who didn't understand or have empathy for how the operators needed them to function. Mm. And so I thought, I took a course my sophomore year at Cornell, um, hospitality development and planning, and it totally transformed my career trajectory because I didn't even know that that was a field, right? The idea that like there were people who spent their careers designing and renovating and building hotels, I had no, I guess it had to get done. I just never thought about it, you know? I always thought of hotels as what I saw, people working in them, operating them. And I thought if there was a way that I could sort of leverage that skill set I gained as an operator, but apply it to making hotels being built and designed better for their end users, that could be some place that I could sort of marry those two loves of still working in hospitality, but being more involved in the creative process of how hotels become what they are. And within Cornell, so if you're if you're doing that, are you taking classes over at the architecture school? Yeah, I I definitely took some classes outside of the hotel school program. Um, Because I transferred in, I spent that first year at Babson, I was playing catch up so much, Mm -hmm. right, on all the core classes and just totally overloading myself and overwhelming myself, frankly. Um, But there was a good number of, the the hotel school in recent years has become much more real estate focused. Mm -hmm. So there was a real estate minor, there was a development concentration, a design concentration. So there were so many courses, like I took a, even in the hotel school program without being an architecture, a drafting course, right? Where we, you know, had drafting boards and trace paper and everything and yeah. we're designing hotel rooms and lobbies and it was a really creative course, you know? Wow, I'm surprised that they would give you um, a straight edge and Oh yeah, and paper. It, it was old school, wow. you know? And I think... Was that in Rand Hall? Uh, no, it was in it was in Statler Hall, though. Oh, Statler Cornell. Hall. Yeah, but I, I took some courses over in Milstein in the architecture mm-hmm. school next to Rand and... Yeah, it's it's it was a really great education and and it helped shape who I wanted to become within the industry in a way that I didn't know when I went there. So when you found this hotel planning and development, yeah, was there a a teacher that stood out out of all the teachers that you had? Yeah, I had a few people at Cornell that that really um, impacted me. One was my advisor, Renita McCarthy. She always sort of pushed me to to new heights and to explore different things and put myself out there. She was my advisor since I joined the school. And then in the development world, two professors, um, Stephanie Robson and Brad Wellstead, I TA'd for them for many semesters in that development course. I took all of their electives that I could squeeze into my schedule. And I just learned so much from both of them. Both of them were you know, developers by background and, and had that expertise. And so I just took every piece of knowledge I could from them while I was there. Wow. And then, so I'm, I'm sure that on all of these tracks at Cornell, you'd also have guest speakers come in. 
all the time. Yeah. Do do any of those really stand out to That's you? That's a good question. Yeah, there were we had so many great speakers um, during my time there. I remember Ron Harrison from Marriott when he mm. came and he ran the global design division at Marriott at the time. And I remember hearing Ron speak and and not really realizing all the standards and the brands and and all the creation behind that. And they showed us when Marriott was at its old headquarters, it was the basement, right? Like the creative labs and the way they had prototypes of all the different rooms and the way they finessed every last detail of what makes a courtyard a courtyard or a residence in a residence in. And I remember just being baffled, like a company that now has 31 brands spent that much time on every last detail of, of these really core brands. Um, so Ron's Ron's speech definitely stands out in my memory. Um, Bill Walsh from Viceroy Hotel Group is probably one of the most captivating speakers I've ever heard present his passion for hospitality and for associates. It wasn't so much design related. It was just hearing him speak. It was like, yeah, that's why I do hospitality. You know, he really has a way to sort of yeah, make people passionate about the industry. He's captivating. He is totally. Hmm. And then, are there any um, are there any people that guest speakers that came that you're working with now as a as a client? Guest speakers. I'm trying to think. Not. I wouldn't say so much guest speakers. Mm-hmm. It was more so like when I'd be looking for summer internships, or I'd be you know, pursuing what my path post-graduation was, mm. you know, the faculty and the peers that I had connected me to alum from the school that worked in different organizations, be it public companies, private companies. And so, you know, some of the relationships that I developed at Cornell, you know, people have moved through their careers to different places and different organizations. And like we talked about how small the industry is, right? You see a name pop up and you're like, oh my God, I, I reached out to you in 2000 and 13 for a summer internship you probably don't remember me but things like that have led to some you know great client relationships that we're now really fortunate to work with at cbre many years later awesome um okay cool so you got to explore and kind of work in this laboratory of all these different ideas at cornell yeah now you're out working on these crazy huge projects delivering them um What's most exciting to you about where you are right now as you look to the future? Well, I think, you know, I'd be lying if I said there there weren't moments in COVID, right, where I sort of pinched myself and like asked, was was I on the right career trajectory? Was I doing what I should be doing, right? And I remember at the onset of COVID when people, you know, I remember, I, I won't name names, but there were some naysayers out there that said, you know, corporate travel's dead, group travel's dead, people are never getting together again. You know, you and I are sitting here at the most well-attended Alice conference (laughs) ever in the history of Alice, right? To think that this could happen now when two or three years ago, people were like, oh no, that's all gonna be happening over a Zoom call, you know? I love Zoom, it's a great way we connect. We all use it as part of our business now. It makes many things a virtual meeting that may have previously required a lot of travel and frustration to get something done but it's no replacement for the in-person connection mm-hmm. that makes our industry so special, right? And so when you ask about what I'm excited about, I'm just excited to see that happening again, right? Like people getting together, spending time together, building relationships. Um, and I think that as we move forward into this sort of new normal and post COVID, it's changing how we design hotels. Mm-hmm. You know, when we look at the future of, you know, work setups. I remember when we were eliminating desks from rooms because people weren't working in their rooms and we wanted to push them downstairs. Yeah, we still probably want to have a great active food and beverage scene that makes people want to spend some time downstairs, but I need to take a Zoom call in my room now everywhere I go and I like having a real desk in a way that people thought my generation wouldn't need them. The losing of the desk, I was like, I, I, I went with it, but I, I was like, <laughs> no. I need to have a place yeah. to spread out. So you stay in a hotel room and try to work for two or three days from a C table, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's no, it's my like, back, my neck, I, and yeah. as I get older, it's worse and worse and yep. worse. Yep. Um, okay, so when I'm in any city in North America, and maybe even globally, but I'm just speaking North America, Okay. and I'm walking down the Central Business District, there are so many CBRE signs, Yes. right? from a commercial real estate perspective. I mean, they're yep. 
massive, huge, powerful organization in this space. Yes. How, like, just to give us context, how how big uh, of the whole commercial real estate yeah. size, like, what's the segment that's hospitality? Yeah, that's great. So CBRE is a firm of 105,000 people God. globally. We have 531 offices, I think. So the, the size and the scale of it can be daunting. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit earlier about my entrepreneurial tendencies and yeah. the fact that I gravitate toward that. What I love about the firm, despite that size, it's incredibly entrepreneurial, right? And so the CBRE Hotels team was a separate company that CBRE acquired probably 10 years ago now. Most of that core team, about 250 people in the Americas, are based out of our Atlanta office. And then we have resources spread around through all the different markets that we operate in. Um, truthfully, when I joined CBRE, I wasn't sure that I wanted to join what I viewed as a brokerage firm, mm -hmm. right? And having been on the owner side, I had this really sort of convoluted view of what a broker was, maybe not necessarily the most positive association of the word. And then when I came to CBRE, I met folks like, you know, Bob Webster comes to mind and really great brokers in the hospitality space who are client advocates, right? And that sort of idea I had in the back of my head of like scummy used car salesmen, I'm sorry, people are probably flinching hearing me say that, but like I couldn't be more baffled by the night and day difference I saw. Yeah. The people who are truly successful in the brokerage world, you know, how relentlessly they service the clients, right? And yeah. so you know, one of the things we always work with our brokerage colleagues on is understanding the cost of property improvement plans, right? Because that dramatically impacts what the asset's going to sell for. If it's a $50,000 a key renovation, a $100,000 a key renovation. And so, you know, they always come to us and they're like, what's the real number for this? And like, do you want the real number? Or like, if we VE'd everything, how cheaply we could achieve this? And like, no, 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 no. Like, we want to be realistic because the only way they build trust with their clients is mm -hmm. if they're accurate, right? That's how people come back for the next transaction and the next transaction, and the next transaction. So, you know, that totally changed my perception of what a brokerage shop like CBRE was. Um, as far as the hospitality vertical, you know, like I said, we're probably, I don't know the exact number, 300, 400 people through the Americas. And our hospitality project management team has grown pretty organically, it started in 2021. Mm -hmm. In the depths of COVID, you know, the leadership team at CBRE was really pragmatic and realized there was a backlog of PIPs coming and property improvement plans that were delayed because of COVID. There was a really great opportunity to acquire great resources from the market that were available because hotel companies weren't renovating in the way they once were. And a lot of hotel companies, you know, greatly reduce the size of their internal project management resources. And then a year or two down the line, we're going to be needing to renovate and reposition all of these assets and not having the resources in house to do it. And yeah. so they were pretty pragmatic in investing in that, in the growth of that business during COVID, you know, really putting the right team in place, even before the revenue was there, mm. and then giving us the mandate to go out and grow the business. Um, and it's been a really fun process. I'd say we're about a team of 20 now working throughout the Americas on the hospitality project management front, um, largely up and down the Eastern seaboard. We've just added some great talent to our team in Texas and pushing out to the West Coast. So we really wanted to sort of dominate the Eastern side of the US and then start making our way westward. And we just took on our first project in Hawaii, which is exciting oh, and just really growing the platform from there. Wonderful. Um... And then as your team is growing and you're looking at all these projects and trying to get the right people to the right clients so that you're filling your pipeline with projects that yes. make sense for you yes. and your clients, Yes. Um, what kind of similarities are you seeing in, in, that, in those efforts? In what sense, Dan? In the sense that you're not you're not going after every hospitality project. No, right? definitely not. So like if you were to like create a target for your, your audience, like who is it? Yeah. What who, is it that we do? Yeah. Yeah. So I would, it's a good question. I would say, you know, we have different offerings for different clients and we, you know, the public, the public version of it is we try to craft solutions that meet different clients needs. Right. 
what I would say we do the most of is, you know, full service, upper upscale and luxury branded hotel renovations and independent boutique luxury lifestyle hotel projects. And then we don't do that many select service hotels on a one-off basis, but where we've, we've actually grown a lot of interest is on rollouts and large program renovations. So we have one project right now we're working on, which is a portfolio of a roughly 20 select service assets, 2,400 hotel rooms scattered through 15 different cities across the US. And because of our size and scale, right, we can have a core team at the program level that understands the nuts and bolts of hospitality mm. paired up with regional expertise in all of those different 15 cities where we have boots on the ground physically there working with our program team to execute a program like that. Great. And then for you personally, what's what would be like the old, like if if I could give you a magic wand and you're like, I get to work on that project. On that project, what project would it be? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I like the more creative projects so things where you're sort of in the upper upscale luxury space it's either unbranded or a soft brand where there's a little bit more leniency to the process and mm -hmm. where we get to sort of have a cool design team bring together a really unique concept and execute it i don't know that the market or i don't i don't know that that's as important to me i think it's just the creative freedom and the ability to like work with our owners and and figure out what would make a hotel like that sink Okay, cool. So leeway, creativity, like kind of a a, uh, a white canvas, if you would. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. But there, of course, there's hotels that like you gravitate toward that like you love on a personal, deep, intrinsic level, right? It's like, oh yeah, it would be a dream to renovate that particular asset, right? Because there's such a deep personal connection to it. You know, mm. for me, it's probably Four Seasons, uh, Costa Rica, and Peninsula Papagayo. It's one oh, of yeah. my favorite resorts. Just the landscape of everything about it is such a unique asset. So if I wave the magic wand, like that'd probably be the one, but it just got renovated and it's a lovely renovation that Meyer Davis yeah, did. Yeah, Meyer Davis so. did that one. They That's did. awesome. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so we're at this time of year where all like high school seniors have submitted their applications. Yes. They're, they're waiting, waiting to hear back. Yep. Right. The if they didn't get in the early decision or whatever. Um, if you were to speak to those students who are waiting to hear back from the ho from different hotel schools. Yeah. Right. Um, what would you say to them about Cornell? Well, they rejected me my first time. So if it happens <laughs> to you, it's not the end of the world, right? There's still light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, there's so much pressure for, for me, like throughout, throughout high school, like getting into a good college was sort of my, I forget what it's called, but like your locus of control, or like what you're aspiring to and you have your sights set on, right? And then when I finally got there, like I had to readjust what motivated me in life, right? Because mm -hmm. it was like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm taking the right classes and I'm in the right extracurriculars and I'm taking the exams and like everything is about getting into college for two or three years of your life, right? And then you actually get there and you're like, now what, right? Like you have to hit that reset button. And so I think, you know, where you, where you go, there's a great book by an author I love, Frank Bernie, where you go is not who you will be. I think that's so true. I mean, I realize it's rich of me to say that I have the great opportunity. Who's the New York Times? Fortune. Yeah, okay. great, great op-ed columnist in, okay. the, in the New York Times. Um, but I think it's so true. Like, you are in control of your destiny, no matter where you go to school or what you study or where you are, how much you put yourself out there, how much you build relationships, how much you network and connect with others, you know? We talked about this a little bit over lunch yesterday. Like, it just feels natural to me because so many of my, like I've built my closest friendships in this industry mm. with whether it's designers or procurement agents or like, these aren't just my colleagues. Like they're people I wanna spend my weekends with and see outside of the office and have meaningful friendships and relationships within life. Mm. And that's cause I love what I do and I love working with them and they're fun, great people to work with. So my work doesn't really feel like work, right? Like it feels fun and enjoyable. And so um, I have friends of mine who totally disassociate themselves from their work, right? It's like 5.30 PM and they turn their phone off and they're like, Ethan, you know, you can do that, right? I'm like, I guess I can, but like, I don't want to, you yep. know what I mean? Like my personal life and my professional life overlap in so many ways. And that's really fulfilling to me. I don't know how people can 
lead two separate lives in that sense. I'm, I'm jealous. I'm sometimes. with you. Yeah, I'm jealous too. But I'm 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 there with you too. I. And that's I think a testament to our industry, right? It's if you go back to what you were saying, just on this anticipating, knowing how others are feeling, you know, connecting with people. Yeah. Um, we kind of do it with each other. In a yeah, way, right. It's, we absolutely do. And then to be around all those people, it's uh, it's this really amazing, supportive fraternity, sorority, just like way of life, if yeah. you will. And um, that's why often sometimes I'll be like, how did you choose hospitality or how did it choose you? Or when did, when did the hooks get into you? Yeah. Um, so also if you're speaking to that college or high school senior, that's looking to go to whatever hotel school. Sure. Um, would you say live in the dorms or live in the hotel? Okay. So that's a funny, <laughs> <laughs> a funny transition. Look, I had a very different collegiate experience than most, right? So I, I studied at Babson for a year. I lived in the dorms. I was in a force triple with two guys who actually became probably my closest friends in life now. And we, neither of them work in hotels. One of them works in trains. One of them works in biotech. And we travel together and we're great lifelong friends now. Um, so I say live in the dorms for a year at least, right? Um, the funny thing for me was when I transferred to Cornell, they didn't guarantee on campus housing for sophomore transfer students, which is what I was. And I went to Ithaca to tour apartments and try to find where I was going to live. And I was staying in a brand new Fairfield Inn by Marriott that had just opened. And on campus? It was not. It was it was dreadfully inconvenient in many senses mm -hmm. to campus, but it was in Ithaca and Ithaca's a small enough town and, and it's actually the eighth most expensive rental market in the in the United States when I was a student. And it's gorgeous. And it's gorgeous, right? <laughs> so it's easy to see why. Um, and so I was staying there, I was staying there and, and the GM of this hotel was like 27, 28 years old. He was a surfer from Southern California. The hotel had just opened in the dead of winter and I was looking for apartments and I wasn't having any luck finding anything at all reasonable. Everything in Ithaca actually rents out like a year in advance. And I made the decision to come in May and I was starting in August. So I was, I was really struggling to find anything. And the GM asked how my search was going and I said, you know, honestly like can i just live here and he's like what like what do you have in mind and i was just joking when i threw it out there and then i went back to the hotel room and said to my mom i was like hey what if i lived here and i was like are you nuts and i was like well they seemed open to the idea so like i drafted up a contract of what i wanted like i paid a very low rate in new york state like all the taxes dropped off i think it was after 30 nights so the taxes went away um, I wanted my room cleaned once a week. Oh, wow. Yeah. I like just like a, I made a wish list, right? I wanted all my nights to be Marriott rewards qualifying. I wanted to pay with an American express card so I could earn membership rewards points. Right. And I took it to them thinking they were going to say, this is ludicrous. But what you have to know about Ithaca, right? If you know, it's gorgeous, you also know it's a very seasonal market. Yeah. And in the dead of winter, um, when I was making the decision, they hadn't seen a successful summer yet. The hotel had just opened. They were selling rooms for $69 a night on third party booking agencies. And so, you know, knowing what I did about hotels and the commissions they were paying, I sort of backed into what I thought was a really reasonable number. And they came back to me and said, look, we're okay with everything, except you're gonna be like a young college guy we want to clean your room twice a week. <laughs> oh, even better. They threw that <laughs> I was in. Like, well, you guys are really hard negotiators, but so, so, um, the way that it was written, I could live there. I had to live, I basically was semester long reservations and I could leave at the end of any semester, but they had to honor the rate the whole way through my time at Cornell. Oh my and God. so at the end of one semester, I basically become Marriott platinum elite and I called to cancel my upcoming reservations because I was going to get a place off campus with some friends. And I got transferred to some like elite retention line and they were like, what can we do to keep your business? And I was like, well, if you could give me, you know, a hundred thousand extra Marriott points every semester, that might keep my business. <laughs> and it actually worked out with the promotions they do every fall and every spring in Bonvoy that it sort of worked out to be pretty much meeting that request. I said, I, I can't walk away from this. Like I left college with 
basically a million Marriott points wow. and lifetime platinum status that uh, was a very unique and different story. So in some senses, I loved it. It was a really atypical college experience, mm -hmm. right? In some ways, though, it did disconnect me a little bit from some of the social elements of collegiate life that I wish I had partaken of more fully. Wow, that's amazing. That's super entrepreneurial. I guess you, you can't shut it off. You know, yep. it's a switch that you either have or you don't. And once it's on, it's always sort of on. Oh man, that's, thank you for sharing that. That right. I actually didn't know that whole thing. You just gave me the, the, the little clip, snippet the, of the it. bullet of the top, but that's, yeah. that's amazing. Wow. It was a different experience, you know? And it's funny, like I literally, when I was in college, like I lived, breathed, slept, eight hotels, you know? And it was funny, like the staff that worked there, having spent that much time there, like I got to know all of them personally, mm. you know? We're still friends to this day. When I go back to campus, one of them works at the on-campus hotel at Cornell now that I often stay at when I'm there. You know, I keep in touch with all of them. They're like my second family in a way, my sort of collegiate family. Could you? Great. How far was it from the hot truck? Eh, 15 minutes, you know, not bad. <laughs> you know, we spent a lot of time out there and some nights in college town that we would, you know, wander over and might not always make it back to the Fairfield Inn. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Wow, so cool. Um, all right. I mean, this has been so fantastic. If if people wanted to learn more about you, like how can they learn more about you or CBRE? Definitely. Well, you know, there's a lot of great information about our firm and our services and offerings on CBRE's website. Um, but feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or I believe my email address will be in the show notes. Yeah, I feel like we could do that. We can do that. Cool. And feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to connect and discuss more about what we do. Okay, awesome. Oh, you know what? I forgot one question. Okay. That I ask everyone. Um, the Ethan I'm talking to you right now, it's a time machine question. Okay. So the Ethan I'm talking to you right now, um, I, if you were to magically appear in front of your 12 year old self pumping gas at that gas station. Okay. At your dad's gas station. Um, what advice would you have for yourself? That's a really good question. I guess it's not as far back in my memory as it is for many of your show guests, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think it would just be don't stress. Everything works out. You know, there's so much pressure put on you to achieve great things, especially when you're young in those formative years. And, you know, my, I was really fortunate to grow up in a family that placed a lot of value on education and supported me in those endeavors. Um, but with that comes a lot of stress around all those other factors. Like, if you work hard, and you follow what you love doing, I think you'll have a successful life. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's almost so cliche where it's like, oh, just follow your passion. And I'm like, okay, well, what does that really mean? But if I really step back and look at my trajectory, and I'm sure that your trajectory, we found this world. Yeah. And everyone can find their own world, but, uh, Sometimes it feels like work, but more often than not, it's not. Yeah. It's just, this is our family. I, you know when you have like a really poignant memory and you can remember like where you were, what you were wearing, where you're like all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. I, I think of one on that note. When I was in my sophomore, sorry, junior year summer planning my internship, which is like typically the most important internship that you get when you're an undergrad. I... I had two opportunities in front of me. One was at Hershey Hospitality Trust in Philadelphia. The other was with an investment bank that I'll leave unnamed. And there was so much pressure around me to choose the investment bank, right? Like salary, respect, prestige, everything about it, you know? And, and when people heard the name of the firm, they were like, you don't say no to them, mm -hmm. you know? So many people told me that. And I remember exactly where I was, exactly where, what I was wearing. I was on the phone in my car talking to Bennett Thomas, who is a senior vice president of finance and sustainability at Hersha. And I had both offers on the table and I was talking to Bennett. He was actually an investment banker by background. And I said, I'm really split. Like my heart tells me to do this, but my, you know, pressures around me and forces that be are making me feel like that's kind of a bad decision and maybe a selfish one, you know? And he was the one, he actually didn't sell me that I should go to Hersha. He's like, you have to think about what you want to do in life. Mm. 
And I thought about that and I thought about the investment bank and I couldn't quantify what good the investment bank did for the world. But I knew the joy of hospitality and I knew the impact that hospitality had to make a positive and meaningful impact on people's lives. And I'm not, look, we're not curing cancer over here. It's not rocket science, right? But there is something very humanistic about our business. Yeah. And in that moment, I was like, I got to go work at Hersha, mm -hmm. you know? And I've spent time with them professionally working and with other firms since, but I've always sort of known from that moment, cut out the noise and be who you want to be. Yeah. It ties into Frank Bruni's book. It does. Mm. Where you go is not who you'll be. And, and I guess I, by extension of that, only you can control who you'll be. And now you're Ethan, bringer of joy. Bringer of joy. <laughs> God, I think a lot of people would like to differ with you on that one, my friend. Well, you know, it's that joy of hospitality, right? And I, yeah, yeah. that's funny. Somebody said to me at a party last night, they're like, you know, the thing I love about, they joke the CBRE crew, but you know, the people that I work with, they're like, you guys are just always smiling. And I said, you know, we've realized that, can I swear? Yeah. I said, you know, being a jackass doesn't achieve better results. You know, <laughs> it just makes people not want to work with you. That's not a curse. It's not a curse. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. It doesn't achieve results. And life is too short to be a jackass. It is. Right. We're and it's all... not nearly as much fun. Yeah, totally. Um, well, hey, I just want to say thank you for your time. I'm, I'm honored th to have you invest your time here um, and to share your story because I think um, this will inspire and impact a lot of other people out there who are at a decision point. And thank you for filling in the blanks for Thank a you lot for of having me. It's been a lot of fun, Dan. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you to our listeners because without you and the growth we're getting every single week, we wouldn't be doing this or I still might because I really, uh, this brings me joy. So <laughs> you know what I still it. would do, but it's, it's growing and it's bringing me joy. So it's checking all the boxes and uh, maybe I should have Frank Bruni on. That would be great. Dan Ryan, bringer of joy. Yes. Uh, hashtag bringer of joy. Thank you. Cheers.